Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome and thank you all for braving the quite atrocious weather. Um, welcome to the eighth Christmas lecture of Edinburgh Neuroscience. This is a really very important part of our year, particularly for me as director. I'm Charles French Constant, the director of Edinburgh Neuroscience. And what we're trying to do with these Christmas lectures is convey our passion for neuroscience and also get across to you, the community that we work uh, with and for, the importance and the impact of what we do. And this year's Christmas lecture will, will be no exception. So every year this lecture is given by a different centre um, and this year it's the Centre for Integrative Physiology. So without further ado I'd like to ask Mike Shipston from that centre to come and introduce this year's lecture. Thank you Charles. It's, uh, no, it's a real pleasure for the uh, Centre for Integrative Physiology um, to host uh, this year's um, Christmas lecture. And just a, a very brief word about um, the centre itself. It's one of the centres within um, Edinburgh Neuroscience. Um, with a focus on a, a lot of people looking at how um, cells, signalings and networks work together to really to control different types of behaviour at the, the whole body level. And also people who are, are looking at really how cells and cells are put together to generate organs, how those organs can go wrong, um, and how we might be able to sort of regenerate them. And one of the key approaches that a lot of people take is really what I'd refer to as a multidisciplinary approach, that they go from different scales, right down to the small scale of a single protein or a single cell, all the way up to using humans or um, animal models of various different types like flies and worms and, and mice and so on. And I think one of the key things is actually just different approaches that we use. We try and look at things in real time. We use mathematical approaches, we use animal models, we use biochemistry, we use all the tools that are available to the modern um, bioscientist to really interrogate fundamental problems uh, and fundamental um, issues that are related to major uh, human diseases and disorders. And tonight's uh, lecture is no example of... Oh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll stop, I'll stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Double whammy, double whammy. <laughs> it just lightens the load a bit. <laughs> so, no, Gareth is, is a fantastic example of actually all those approaches. Um, Gareth is Professor of Experimental uh, Physiology in Edinburgh. By training, he's a mathematician. He's a mathematician who's doing biology. And actually, his work really exploits those different areas, bringing maths together with biology to address really big problems. And he's also a fantastic an advocate for actually how you do multidisciplinary work. He, for example, runs a very large program funded by the, the EU, which takes in people from all over the, um, the, the EU to come together to address the problems he's going to talk about tonight. And again, that, it brings together people who are mathematicians, biologists, e e um, economists as well. So I think, with no further ado, I'll introduce Gareth as his lecturer. I'm sure he's going to highlight to you uh, the power and the beauty of the work that he does, but also his importance and its impact for the newest science community. So without any further ado, uh, I'll introduce Gareth, Gareth Lane. Do our genes still fit the newer science of appetite and obesity? Gareth. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Charles. And again, thanks to all of you. It's a truly horrible day today. Uh, and I'm so pleased that there's any audience at all. In fact, uh, early on in my career, I gave a talk down in London on a day like today. And I went down there. And I wasn't the only speaker. There were two of us went down there. And the audience consisted of the chairman and one other. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been here at this university uh, for about 20 years now. Uh, just over 20 years, 20 years and a few days. Um, and actually, the, when you're appointed here as a professor, you have to give an inaugural lecture, as you may know. And so actually, that inaugural lecture, nearly 20 years ago now, was in this lecture theatre. And I thought at that time it was like lecturing at the bottom of a bucket. It still <laughs> feels like that now. Well, I'm a neuroscientist and I am all my career really, for uh, nearly 40 years now, I've worked on the hypothalamus. 
I know there are neuroscientists in the audience. Can I ask you, what do you think of when you think of the hypothalamus? Anybody? Is that blank? Is anybody going to be brave enough to say anything? Regulation. Regulation? Of everything. Of everything. Well, that's a good kind of summary. I'm interested that actually nobody's mentioned sex already. I, I, whether the neuroscientists here are, are too shy? I don't know. I always like to know my audience. But actually the first inaugural lecture that I gave here, uh, my title was Sex, Drugs and Rock and Roll. So, if we look to where I am now, that's where I was in 1994, Mr. Tickle, and here I am talking about obesity. So, the journey that I've made is from Mr. Tickle to Mr. Greedy in 20 years. Now, I'm going to share with you that journey today. It's a personal journey, and it's a journey that I know that many of you are also in the process of. Actually, in 1994, the Edinburgh Evening News picked up on my title and actually gave me the name Dr. Love. <laughs> I hope there aren't any journalists here in the audience, and I wonder if they've made comments. <laughs> anyway, this journey <clears throat> from sex to obesity over 20 years is fortunately a journey I haven't taken on my own. In fact, as you can see, this is over those years, from 1994 up to 2008 here, this is the rising trend of obesity in the UK. From about 15% back in 1994 to about 25% of the adult population now. Now, it's nothing, we don't need to beat ourselves the head too much. It's happening globally. Pretty well every country in the world has, over this period, ex uh, experienced the same startling, year-on-year, -year increase in the levels of obesity. And of course it's a matter of enormous health concern, because with this level of weight gain come a whole myriad of serious health problems, including diabetes, many cancers. I'm not going to go into them, I'm not going to dwell on, on, on the downside now, just hope you'll kind of enjoy that journey happily to obesity that I've taken, and, you ha and, and many of you are as well. I'm going to talk about actually the origins of that, why we get fat and why we're getting fatter over the years, year on year. At some level, of course, it is simple. We all know it, don't we? That we all, our bodies are a balancing act between the energy that we take in and the energy that we use. And this is, I think, how people usually think of it, as that food on one side and exercise on the other. And we blame for this increase in obesity something that's been called the obesogenic environment. There are kind of many things that we think might have changed in our environment to drive this increasing level of obesity. And I mentioned a few here. Sugar, fat, sloth. You've all got your cards. Who thinks it? If you pick your favourite here, please. Who thinks it's sugar? No, not many of you. Fat, fat intake. No, a lot of don't knows, I think. A, a couple of yeses. What about sloth? Laziness. Actually, there are mostly no's to everything. What about advertising, then? Who thinks it's the advertising? No, no. You've all got your own ideas, but none on that list. That's kind of interesting. All of them. Who thinks it's all of them? All right, it's all of them. We're getting there. It's a whole combination of all of these things, we think. Nobody got any other ideas? Who thinks it's global warming? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if you still think that at the end. So, let's have a look. <clears throat> let's see how much you think about actually what you're eating. You're all a kind of intelligent audience. You have to be intelligent, otherwise you wouldn't be here tonight. So, what are you going to choose? Starbucks tall latte or a can of Coke? Which do you think has 
the least calories. If you think it's the Starbucks has the least, let's see your green card. Think it's the Coke that's the least, think the red card. It's a kind of real mixture here, I think. Let's see what the answer is. <coughs> it's the letter. It's the letter. Can of Coke, that's the advertising back in 1960s, I remember it well. Anybody want to fill in the missing words there? Anybody want to shout it out? Can of Coke, what's the slogan? Things go better with Coke. <laughs> All right then, another one. Avocado or a Mars bar? Okay. Let's put your hands up together. If it's if it's never, if the avocado is the healthier option, green. If the Mars bar is, then red. Avocado for green. So okay. A lot of avocados. I see quite a lot of avocados. What's the answer? No? Yes. <laughs> well, there's health and health. No question about it. Avocado. What about the slogan? A Mars. Okay, so advertising has got through to you then. <laughs> and it's not a new thing. These adverts are, are pretty old. All right then, last one. If it's a banana, then I want green. If it's Milky Way, I want red. Which is, which is the heavier in calories? Okay, it's a pretty mixed bag as well. I'm seeing a kind of mixture of reds and greens around the place. But well, pretty well spot on, actually. There, there's hardly anything to choose between them. Okay. What about the slogan? We'll come to the slogan. Anybody remember the slogan? The sweet you can eat between meals without spoiling your appetite. Doesn't that tell you a lot? <laughs> I, and actually, isn't it amazing how things have changed? When I was a child, when I was a child, we weren't worried. My mother wasn't worried about us getting fat. The reason why she stopped eating sweets because we wouldn't eat all our dinner. Eat the, leave the sweets till after you've had your pudding. <laughs> Our environment has certainly changed. But you all know the slogans, you all remember those slogans. Not sure that actually advertising isn't a new thing. And these were marketed pretty aggressively back then. So, there's our obesity trends. There we are, USA way in the lead as always. <coughs> There's Australia and the UK marked up there. So, sugar. How much can sugar account for this? <clears throat> well, that's the data from the United States. That's the sugar consumption in America. And that actually is at the heart of a big case that's being made that sugar, all sugars, are the real culprit for the growth in obesity. Looks pretty persuasive, but never believe associations. Let's look at what happens in Australia and the UK. Over the same period, in both of these countries, actually, our consumption has been falling over that time. It's first pointed out by Barclay and Brand Miller, in in, 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 and they were demonised for it. They called it the Australian paradox. There was a storm of controversy, but the data came out, and they were absolutely right. They were right not just there, they're right here too. Actually, this sugar consumption has been falling in, the, in many countries while obesity levels have been growing. Well, what about all our other foods then? Look at that milk and cream. That's been declining. Actually, the decline is much bigger than you see there, because that's the total volume consumed. Actually, we've switched in this time from whole milk to semi-skim milk. So not only is the overall consumption fallen, then the fat content of it has fallen as well. Potatoes down, bread down, processed meat pretty steady, fresh meat down, fish steady. There's only one food group 
that has gone up. What's that? Fruit. You're right? Fruit. Fruit and vegetables. So if you want to blame anything for our obesity. <laughs> In fact, the calorie consumption in the UK on the best day, the data are hard to find, often arguable, but they look actually as though over this time our calorie consumption per person has actually been dropping while obesity rates have been rising. All right, where do our genes come in? That was the title, our genes still fit. And of course our genes, the a, a thought to a body weight is thought to be about 70% heritable. Now people argue about exactly how heritable it is, whether it's 40% or 50% or 80%, but all studies and all groups agree that there's a very large heritable component of our body weight. The best predictor of how fat you are and you're going to be is how fat your parents were. You can see it very clearly. The classic data from this was from twin studies. Identical twins, with the same environment and the same genes. They tend to be very, very similar in body weight to each other. Whereas non-identical twins, well, there's a lot of divergence, even though they share the same environment. <laughs> so this is the classic study that first established that there's a really strong genetic component to have how fat we're going to be. Now, that's not in conflict with the fact that we're getting fatter, that we're getting more obese. The interpretation is that our genes determine our potential for putting on weight. And the conclusion is that we're now realizing our potential in the modern environment. But because of this heritability, there has for a long time been a hunt for this crock of gold. Is there a gene for obesity that we can find and that we can fix? And that's been a vision for a long, long time. Back in the 1950s, the way that people started exploring it were to find mutant animals that were exceptionally mut uh, obese and selectively breed from those to generate strains of obese animals and study those in the hope that they would reveal the genetic basis of, of obesity. And this was one of the strains that, that emerged from that type of breeding program. It's called the Obob mouse. It was, known to, it was discovered from just breeding experiments that there had to be just a single gene that was responsible for the obesity in this mouse. And this mouse, discovered in the 1950s, plays a really, really fundamentally important part in our modern understanding of appetite regulation and obesity. Because it was from this mouse that in 1994, the year that I came to Edinburgh, this remarkable landmark paper was published. What the authors here had done was they, had, they found the genetic mutation in the Obob mouse. They found the gene, and that gene, which was a new gene, coded for a new hormone, the first new hormone to be found for 50 years. And that hormone they called leptin. Leptin, this was a revolution in physiology. And the generation that followed the next 20 years after that has really followed up and pursued that initial startling discovery of a whole new concept, a new extension of, phys of physiology. Until then, I don't think neuroscientists and physiology, physiologists had really thought very much about appetite. You know, what is there to think about? You're hungry, you eat. You're not hungry anymore, you stop eating. But to understand that there's a whole physiology and a whole new hormonal system that seems to be involved in this was a, a bit of a revelation at that time. So what they discovered was that in, the, in this Obob mouse, these mice couldn't make leptin. They were, they were deficient in leptin. So it wasn't that they were having a hormone that made them fat. They were lacking a hormone that stopped them getting fat. Well, it turned out, not only was it a new hormone, it was a hormone that came from the most unexpected of places. 
It's a hormone that came from our fat. Now at that time, I probably like most of you, but he didn't think that fat, fat was intelligent. We kind of thought that the fat in our body was a bit like the lard you get out of the fridge and was just smothered around our body. Well, it's not. Fat is contained in these lovely little cells called adipocytes. They're like balloons that fill up and store that fat and they store it safely. Now, these cells not only store fat and they expand as they, as they store fat and shrink as, the, as that fat is used up, they're also active intelligent cells. They're listening to messages in the body from all kinds of sites and they're communicating with other cells in the body and they're communicating with the brain. In fact, you might even think they're part of the brain. They're, 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 if, they're, if we think of the nervous system or the brain as being a system of communication from cells to cells, and these are really part of, of that intelligent system. Well, that discovery of leptin really looked very exciting. So if the fat cells were producing something that stopped you eating, that meant there was a kind of feedback. When we get fat, there's a signal that goes to the brain that says, we've had enough, we're fat enough, you can stop eating now. And if that's the case, then if you find those old mice and give them leptin, you should restore them to normal. And that, of course, is exactly what happens. For these leptin-deficient mice, it's a miracle cure. You give them leptin, their body weights miraculously come back to normal. And this is a story from mice, but it's not only a story in mice. Because, of course, all mammals have leptin. All mammals have the same system, including humans. So the question is, are, is obesity because we lack leptin? Well, there was a hunt amongst the geneticists, the human geneticists. Could we find obese humans? And is it the case that obese humans lack leptin in the same way as these mice do? And the answer is that some do. Steve O'Reilly in Cambridge discovered the first families, the first human families, whose mutation was identical to that mutation in the Albob mouse. And here is one of his first children. I remember Steve describing this child, saw this child at three years old. At that time, the child was, was the second child of a family. The first child was perfectly normal. The second child was at three years old, enormously obese, and voraciously hungry. Remember him saying that at that time, uh, the, the consensus was when you have a child like this, it's the parent's fault. It's bad parenting. And the intervention had to be behavioral therapy of the parents, by what Steve, I think, described as the nutritionalist Nazis. They assessed this child at baseline in the clinic. And what they would do at that time to assess the appetite at baseline of the child was put the child in a room with lots of food, leave him or her there for, for 20 minutes, come back, find out how much they'd eaten, go away and try the behavioral training on the parents and child, come back a few weeks later, give them the same test and see how much they'd eat. They had no baseline data for this child because when they put this child in the room, he had everything. Never seen anything like it. That's the, 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 it's one of the first cohorts that were given leptin. And this child, again, lies for the mice. The leptin is a miraculous cure. That child has grown up, continued with leptin treatment, past puberty into adulthood, and has grown up to, to be a, 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 an adult of perfectly normal, healthy body weight, and healthy in pretty well every way. So for these individuals that have this particular defect, leptin was indeed a miraculous cure. But, and there is a but, these gene defects were phenomenally rare. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of people that have this defect. And in fact, the only cases that are known are from consanguineous marriages. These are cousin-cousin marriage, marriages in particular communities. So it's a, 
a very rare feature of certain in inbred communities. It is not an explanation for obesity in general. And in fact, the leptin receptors in the general, the leptin mutations in the general population are very rare indeed. How do we think leptin acts? And could leptin nevertheless help reduce body weight in normal people? Well, we all have this population of ad adipocytes in our body. One of the things that our genes do is specify how many of these there are. It determines, if you like, our potential for obesity just by determining that population of adipocytes. And of course, to keep them at a steady level, we need to eat at a steady level. What happens if we binge and, and eat a whole lot more? Of course, those swell up. As a result of that, then leptin is secreted, which will reduce our appetite, that will reduce our food intake, and everything comes back to normal. That's the homeostatic loop. If we diet, those cells shrink, there's less leptin now, that drives intense hunger, that stops us dieting, things come back. Simple homeostatic mechanism. We defend our body weight. And we defend it through our physiology remarkably effectively, as we'll see when we come on. But is that really what happens? Is that really what happens to us? We know what happens to rats. We do know what happens to rats. Remember that advert. A sweet you can eat between meals without spoiling your appetite. I'm not going to tell you about many of our experiments, but I'll tell you about this very simple one that Catherine did, just to test that idea. What happens if you give a rat just a treat every day for a week? Will it spoil its appetite? Remarkably, in these experiments, the rats were given a sweet treat, condensed milk, 20 calories worth. That's quite a lot for, for a rat, because a rat normal intake is only about 80 calories a day. So this is about a quarter of its normal calorie. You know, it's equivalent to a uh, double cheeseburger every day. What happens? Well, actually, they're given this in addition to the normal diet. They eat that, they eat the, the treat, they love it. But they will eat less of the rest of their food. Pretty well exactly. They compensate almost exactly for that additional treat. It does indeed ruin their appetite if you like. And so as a result, you're giving them this extra double cheeseburger every day, they don't put on any weight at all. It's actually pretty difficult to get rats on mice fat. You can do. If you don't give them the choice, if you just give them energy-dense food and you give them lots of it, you will get them fat. But they will, but you have to push them. They will defend, they will uh, 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 like crazy against that. They will, they will protect their body weight. And humans do as well. We know that. We're not really conscious of it, but it's been studied extensively that, you know, one-off big meals or occasional snacks, actually humans, they don't even think about it, but actually they also reduce their energy expenditure. It's, it's, it's harder to get people to change their body weight as well. So, that's how leptin works. Is it a miracle drug? Can it help us treat obesity once you're already obese? Well, surely if people are already obese, and give them leptin, maybe it's going to help. I don't recommend these leptin chocolates, by the way. <coughs> the problem is, and of course this is tried early on, and the answer I have to say is a lemon. This is the great hope, that leptin would have prospects for really being a drug that could cure obesity and the great obese. And the answer is that if you give this to obese people, well, actually, it's pretty erratic. You've got to give very high doses. And at the top there, even if you give very high doses, a few will show some weight loss, but many, many won't. And there are really only a few good responders to leptin treatment. <laughs> and the answer is, and they're in, it's down there in the bottom, if you measure how much leptin is in the circulation, Obese people aren't obese because they don't have enough leptin. When people are obese, they're producing lots of leptin. The problem isn't they're not producing the leptin. The problem's rather different. The 
problem is that when you produce a lot of leptin, you become insensitive to it. You develop something called leptin resistance. Now, that idea might be familiar to many of you. As many of you will know about diabetes and what diabetes is. Diabetes is a disease. We all agree it's a disease. All who think it's a disease. Yes, it's, diabetes is a disease. Dis a diabetes is a disease of insulin resistance. It arises because, not because we don't have insulin, not type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is because you can't produce insulin. Type 2 diabetes arises because you produce too much of it and actually the systems that should respond to it switch off. They don't see it anymore. Now, this is what's happening in obesity. It's not that we don't have enough leptin, it's that we stop responding to it. Now, if that's the case, if we call diabetes a disease through that mechanism, then by the same logic we have to understand obesity as being a disease. Now, you need to understand the consequences of this. Leptin is this important signal that normally, without us even thinking about it, allows us to restrain our food intake to maintain our body weight. So what goes wrong? What goes wrong is when we eat and we put on weight, this signal comes from the fat tissues that tells us to stop eating. You've had enough. Cut down your calories. If we ignore that and keep on eating and drive it, then we will maintain a high body mass, and then we'll become insensitive to that leptin signal. We don't hear it anymore. And now our body will defend its new higher body weight. And it'll be hard to shift from that. And that is really the pathogenesis of obesity as we understand it. But to understand what's really going on, we've got to get into the details of where leptin's acting and how it's acting. I told you I work in the hypothalamus. It's this little part at the bottom of the brain and the center of the brain. There it is. I think you can pretty well forget about the rest of the brain. The, bra the rest of the brain isn't really important. It's just there to protect the hypothalamus, as far as I can. <coughs> you can think of it as so much stuffing. The hypothalamus does everything that's interesting or important. It controls sex, it controls stress, it controls appetite, our growth, our body weight, our cardiovascular system, all aspects of reproduction, sexual behavior, everything that's really interesting. <coughs> the rest of the brain, they say, has something to do with thinking. I've not seen any evidence of that myself. <laughs> that's the human brain. And these are these kind of uh, stuffing bits all around the, 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 the top. Of course, we work mostly on rats. You think that a rat brain is nothing like a human brain. <clears throat> well, of course, it isn't, doesn't have so much stuffing. But actually, the bits that I'm talking about, the hypothalamus, these are ancient because they're so important, because they do things that really matter. After all, we're animals that have got designed through evolution to do two things above all else. That is to feed ourselves, to keep ourselves alive, and once we've fed ourselves, our next priority is sex. These are the two things that drive selection and drive evolution. These are governed by the hypothalamus, and these mechanisms have been conserved through millions of years of evolution. The systems that do this in the hypothalamus are basically the same in the rat as in, in the human and the same in all mammals. In other words, the rat is a good model. And in fact, we know it's a good model because every gene and every mechanism that we know now, and some of those I'll talk about, that are involved in appetite regulation, the same pathways, the same genes, the same systems are present in humans. That means that we can translate the knowledge we get from the rat into the human. So let's look at the hypothalamus. There is a section through the brain, and that's where the leptin receptors are. In this tiny little bit of the brain, right at the very bottom. We can find them. These are the cells that are responding to that signal from the fat tissue. What are those cells? What are they doing? Well, this is the hypothalamus. It's a complicated place. The cortex is a bit like Australia in a millions of miles of desert 
a few eucalyptus trees around the edge, but largely featureless and uninteresting. The hypothalamus is a bit like Europe, lots of little countries, all with their peculiar ways and eccentric patterns. And this part of the hypothalamus is the most European part of the atlas of the brain. <coughs> there, you'll find these cells. These, these cells are GHRH cells. I'll tell you more about those. But these cells control the secretion of growth hormone from the pituitary. They determine how tall we're going to be. And also aspects of our body shape and mass. These cells control the release of dopamine. And the dopamine controls the secretion of prolactin. Prolactin is the hormone that triggers milk production. The synthesis of milk in lactation. These cells, just recently discovered, only about 10 years ago, they make a peptide called kispeptin. It's a remarkable peptide. It controls the onset of puberty. And it controls the, the secretion of many of the hormones of reproduction. And it's a sexually dimorphic system. It's really responsible for that difference in body shape between male and female. And these cells, these cells make something called neuropeptide Y. These cells are the mother load of appetite. If you kill off these cells, and it's now possible to do this through these extraordinary tools that are available through modern molecular physiology, it's possible to kill off just these cells through genetic engineering. If you do that, if you kill off just those cells, then an animal will stop eating completely. Extreme anorectic. The more cells you kill off, the less they will eat. And if you stimulate these cells selectively, and again, through what is now possible through the extraordinary tools of molecular physiology, it's possible to make these cells sensitive to light, to engineer them so they'll be sensitive to light. And then if you shine a light on this part of the brain, then an animal will eat while the light is on and stop as soon as it's switched off. These cells are the cornerstone of the systems that drive appetite. And there's another population of cells there. If we look at where the re leptin receptors are, some are on those NPY cells, neuropeptide Y cells, but some are on these cells. And these cells make another peptide called alpha MSH. If neuropeptide Y is the driver of appetite, Alpha MS MSH is the blocker. It is the most potent inhibitor of feeding that we have discovered. These cells, if activated, will just stop feeding altogether. And in fact, <clears throat> so the, this little part of the hypothalamus is a really complicated place. If you think about it, all of those things that I've talked about have got something to do with energy and appetite regulation. And they're all packed together, but they're doing really quite different things. So there are those cells that control growth hormone and prolactin secretion, these that control puberty. What's puberty got to do? Actually, we enter puberty at a point when our fat mass is high enough. Actually, the, at the point of onset of puberty depends on the levels of body fat. They control hunger, they will drive eating, and they will drive what's called satiety. All in this tiny, tiny little place. Now, that's a problem. We can do fantastic things these days with brain imaging and PET scanning. You can't, it doesn't help us in the hypothalamus. This is a tiny, tiny, tiny little snap of tissue full of cells that are doing all kinds of different things. There's kind of no chance of actually getting a technique like that to, re to resolve what's happening down here. So I've talked about leptin as being one of the key signals that restrains our appetite, that stops us eating too much. But there's another side to it. There always has to be. What is it that makes us hungry? What is it? What physiological signal drives, drives that hunger? Where does that come from? Yeah, I've got to step back a bit. Because I'm going to tell you my story. My story from 20 years ago or so was that this is the system that I was interested in. I was interested in those cells that control the secretion of growth hormone. 
Why? Well, this paper had come out in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the most famous medical journals in the world. And this was the conclusion. Diminished secretion of growth hormone is responsible in part for the decrease of body mass, the expansion of adipose tissue, and the thinning of the skin that occurs in old age. I remember this was 20 years ago. I was about 40 then. I thought, I'd better learn about this fast if I'm going to stop that happening. And of course, it is one of the features. As we get old, we put on weight. And in fact, as we do that, a large part of that is because of this age-related decline in growth hormone secretion <coughs> that we can do almost nothing about. We seem to be able to do nothing about, but there's this paper from Cy Bowers. And they, it was a remarkably interesting paper because they had found a synthetic drug that they said could stimulate the secretion of growth hormone. And this was a rem offered a remarkable opportunity. Would it be possible, do you think, to find a drug that could reactivate the growth hormone system that is declining with age, and in fact reverse the effects of aging? And this was a kind of dream that drove a lot of research in drug companies and actually got us interested in this as well. Only indirectly, <clears throat> but at that time, this was the time my PhD student, Suzanne Dixon, I was working in Cambridge. She is now a professor of physiology in Gothenburg and is one of the leaders in the field that I'm going to talk about now. But her contribution during her PhD was to show that that paper of Cy Bowers, who said that it acted on the pituitary to specifically release growth hormone, was wrong in two important respects. She showed that actually that peptide, GHRP, acted mainly in the hypothalamus on those cells that you might be familiar with now in the arcuate nucleus. And this is a marker just to show that at the time that these cells were activated after GHRP had been injected. In fact, we could, as a result of that, as soon as this was, the, these results were discovered, I got a phone call from Merck and Co. in the United States, who'd been working on these peptides and peptides like this as anti-aging molecules, and they had realized that actually their focus of attention on the pituitary was wrong. We got it right, and they just wanted us to carry on working in that system. So literally, I got a phone call from America saying, what will it take for you to keep on working this problem? A nice position to have. Now, let me keep Suzanne for a few years longer. But I came here. We carried on working on that in conjunction with Merck. And we narrowed down exactly where GHRP was acting. And we showed it's acting on these GHRH cells, but also on these cells, that the neuropeptide Y cells, the ones that I talked about, that were the drivers of feeding behavior. And, those, and we showed also that those cells project up to the paraventricular nucleus, which we know is a major site involved in feeding. And we show that those cells actually switch off these other cells that we know are the satiety cells. But this was a synthetic peptide. So what? It looked really interesting. But if it's a synthetic peptide that's acting very specifically in part of the brain, there's got to be a receptor for it. And the hunt was then on to find the receptor for GHRP. And our colleagues we were working with in Merck, from our work, looked for it. And they had been looking for it in the pituitary and they hadn't found it. They now started to look for it in this part of the hypothalamus and they found it. From that part of the hypothalamus, they extracted the gene and understood that and it was a new receptor and that's the map of its distribution. And there it is, just in the hypothalamus, nowhere else. But what is this? It's now, it was what's called an orphan receptor. We had a synthetic peptide that's not made in the brain, but we'd found a receptor. But the, what is the actual real ligand for the receptor? What is this receptor C that is produced? Well, the answer came from a Japanese group in 2000. They discovered the second new hormone in a generation, a hormone they called ghrelin. And this 
turned out, and they f how did they find it? They found it by something called reverse engineering. From the nature of the GHS receptor, they worked out what the ligand structure had to be, and they looked for it, and they found it, and they found the gene. So the discovery of the leptin led to the discovery of the hormone, and the hormone turned out to be another new hormone, and it turned out to be secreted from the stomach. And it turned out to be secreted from the stomach when it's empty. So when the stomach is empty, it is releasing ghrelin that is now acting at those receptors that we've been looking at for GHRP to drive growth hormone secretion and to drive hunger and appetite. So there we now know, the real ligand is ghrelin. When ghrelin is present, then there's activity in these two populations of cells, the satiety cells are switched off, and they drive growth hormone and hunger secretion. And these, soon after, were the measurements of ghrelin in humans. These Famous paper, again in the New England Journal of Medicine, 2003, studied ghrelin in obese patients when they were on enforced diet. And it was remarkably revealing. Before weight loss in blue, there you see whenever the stomach's empty, then as the stomach's empty, then ghrelin levels are rising. As soon as you eat, they drop again, then they rise again, they drop again, they rise again. And that's before the weight loss in blue. Actually, the ghrelin levels were pretty normal in those obese patients, just as you'd expect. Although they were obese, the ghrelin levels were normal. But after the weight loss, after dieting, what happens? After dieting, those levels are a lot higher. Now, this is one of the pieces of the jigsaw. That explains why you take an obese person, you put them on a diet, and you bring them down to normal weight, they're not a normal weight person. They're an obese person who are, are in what their brain thinks is starvation mode. And the hunger signal is exaggerated. They're excessively hungry, even though they're of a normal weight because of this, this it, it, uh, it, extravagant secretion of ghrelin. So can we lower ghrelin levels? And if we do that, Will that cure obesity? Well, surgery works. Lots of things don't work in weight, weight, weight management. But this surgery, the gastric bypass, is effective in about 85% of patients, of the most obese patients. And for those, it is really a remarkable, it's almost a miracle cure. It's extraordinary how fast the, not only the weight is lost, but the appetite is lost. They don't get this insatiable appetite that you get with, with, with dietary restriction. And remarkably, many of these obese patients also have diabetes, and the diabetes is also resolved within days of this bypass. It's a remarkable cure, not just for obesity, but also for diabetes. It doesn't work in every case, but in the great majority. Let's contrast that with dieting. How effective is dieting? The best data is for people under long-term medically controlled diets, strict medical supervision, monitored weight loss. 85% of those will have regained their original weight or more a year after the diet has ended. We know, we know that dieting, even under medical supervision, is not an effective way for most people. But it's not just ghrelin. Had we got the answer with ghrelin? Had we got everything right? No, we hadn't. In the years that I've covered, we've discovered a whole host of signals that come from the gastrointestinal tract and work all on these systems in the hypothalamus and a few other parts of the brain. We now know that insulin doesn't only act in the periphery, it also acts on those same systems in the brain. And from the duodenum and gut, a whole range of hormones, some new to science, some just discovered in the last few years, they're coming out, but PYY, GLP, GIP, there's a whole stack of these, a whole range of systems. And they're not just controlling appetite, they're controlling our metabolic rate. They're controlling our energy expenditure, how, how much we move around, and, and they're controlling reproduction, many of our kind of fundamental body systems. 
when you're on severe dietary restriction, I don't understand how difficult it is to maintain that. When you go on an intense diet, not only do you feel intense hunger, you also feel cold. You feel cold because you are cold. Your body runs at a lower temperature, your metabolic rate slows down. You feel lethargic, you feel lethargic because your normal energy expenditure is switched off. You don't move around so much, you don't fidget so much. You feel pretty depressed, your libido goes, sex, uh, sex is out. No, if you're starving, no, no, sex is out. You're more, even more liable to get infections because the immune system is switched off. So think of the obese person on a diet. They're ragingly hungry, they're losing libido, they're depressed, they feel lethargic, they feel cold. It's no surprise, it's really hard to maintain that. It's no surprise that we really desperately need a good way of helping people like that. So do our genes still fit? Come back to this question I started with. Well, I'm going to tell you that there isn't a single gene for obesity. Our body weight is regulated by hundreds of genes. All of these systems that I've talked about all contribute. And we now know from hunting from genes in obese patients that the biggest single gene that's linked with obesity only accounts for a few percent of it. There are lots of genes that all make a little contribution. I say that our genes work brilliantly, fantastically well in all of us. What they do is we gain weight, then they restore our body weight. They defend our body weight. And as we lose weight, they restore it through different mechanisms. I'm going to look at just how effective that is. I'm going to tell you my own personal story. We measure body mass by, by this simple equation. It's, you can all do the calculators online. It's a ratio between how heavy you are and how tall you are. And these are the categories that we use, and that's the population. That was the, the blue is the population of the UK in 1995, and there it is in 2003. That population distribution has shifted over to the right. And actually, we can tell to make it personal. Make it my story, from Mr. Tickle to Mr. Greedy. In 1971, I weighed 10 stone, 7 pounds, as normal, healthy BMI. Here, mind, 2014, 13 stone, 7 pounds, overweight. Not unusual, but I'm pretty overweight. Over those 42 years, my body weight has increased by 42 pounds. That's a pound a year. I'm a mathematician. I can do that some. <laughs> a pound of weight is equivalent to about 3,600 food calories. That's an excess. If you have an excess of energy in over energy out of 3,600 calories, you put on a pound of weight. That's just 10 calories a day. 70 a week. 80 allowing for the energy we take to digest that food. My weight gain that's led me from normal weight to obesity, which is pretty much similar to what's happened to the population as a whole, is the equivalent of eating an extra banana a week. Now, any system that can regulate your energy balance that closely is doing a fantastic job. The miracle here is not, the surprising thing is not that we're getting fat. The amazing miracle is that we're so good at maintaining a pretty constant body weight. When, as we all saw here, we haven't really got the faintest idea of how many calories are in the food we eat. We don't bother that much about it. We vary our food from day to day. We don't consciously monitor our calories, or very few of us do. I certainly have never done that. And yet, we keep, because of these homeostatic systems, because of our hypothalamus, because of our genes, we all, all of us, or nearly all of us, do a fantastically good job. But we're still getting fat out. And we still have something to explain. Even though our genes are so wonderful and so great, we still don't know. Well, let's go back a minute. And I'm going to say, frankly, we don't know all of the answers. But let's go back and look at that original balance. Energy out, the energy we use. We think of it as being 
uh, jogging, and we're all kind of obsessed about jogging. You can't cross the meadows without being mown down by hordes of joggers. You know. <clears throat> Actually, the physical activity only counts for 30, about 30% 30 of the energy that we use. We use about 10% just in digesting and processing the food that we eat. And about 60% is what's called our basal metabolism. That's keeping us warm, keeping our body temperature, keeping our blood going around, keeping our heart going, keeping our, our respiration going. Actually, the bulk of the energy we use is in all of these things. Now these, the basal metabolism, is regulated. It's controlled by these systems in the hypothalamus. They determine how fat we are. They determine how much energy our bodies use. And the processing food, that's just 10%. We shouldn't ignore that 10%. Remember, all we've got to account for is difference of a banana a week. Even a bit of difference in that will make a difference. And actually, that's an average anyway. Different, diff if you have a different diet, you use more or less than that. But let's have a look. You all said at the start that sloth was responsible. Well, what is the evidence? Actually, it's mixed. Uh, certainly over the last 20 years, it's actually difficult to actually find any evidence that our physical activity has really changed significantly in that time. This is a London Transport Survey that's miles cycled in London. There are a whole lot of kind of similar studies. They really give very mixed results. It really isn't clear that we're doing it. In fact, you know, membership of gyms, we all know is at a massive height for height. I mentioned the joggers everywhere, but you know, it's, it's sometimes difficult, really, to, 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 to measure how much physical exercise we do. But the evidence isn't clear. What is clearer is that if you take an obese person and you put them on exercise, then actually it doesn't make much difference, not to their body weight. Why not? Well, my mother would have told you, if you don't know, my mother used to say every Sunday morning when she was cooking the Sunday dinner, She'd send us all out for a long walk to work up an appetite. Does that sound familiar? The fact is that when you exercise, it stimulates appetite. And that's one of the big problems of, of using exercise as an intervention. There are other problems. But essentially, a whole lot of studies now have concluded that exercise is great, it gets you fitter. I'm not saying don't exercise, it's great for cardiac fitness, great for a whole lot of other things, but for body weight, no. But other things have changed. I was the only one that voted for global warming. <laughs> Think about this. This is in the UK. That's the percentage of households with central heating. And that is the mean in internal household temperature. Look how that's risen. We're living in warmer environments. That means we're using less energy to keep ourselves warm. We don't think about it, but we are. It's a global phenomenon. This is right across the UK. It's happening everywhere all around the world. We don't even think about it. It's been neglected. Are we quite sure that actually the energy that we're saving simply through living in warmer houses isn't part of the contributor? I'm not. I would vote for global warming. I'm not so sure that it isn't the food we eat. We use about... 10% of our energy on processing the food. And the problem when we buy highly processed food is it's pretty well pre-digested. We use less energy in consuming it. And we're eating more processed food. At the moment, it's still only maybe 10% of the calories we take in. So we're not sure that it can... But remember, all we need to account for is a banana a week. And maybe actually the energy that we're not using in digesting our food is contributing to that drive. So, what are the prospects for treating? Mm -hmm. Nothing works, but there is hope. <laughs> Nearly finished. In 2008, the MRC and the Wellcome Trust commissioned this survey. And they looked at the, the, benefit, the costs and benefits of investment in basic research. They concluded two really important things. What they concluded was that for every pound invested, there was a stream of benefits that was equivalent to earning 38p in perpetuity. That's a 38% rate of interest on your investment. It's fantastic. You won't get that from the bank. 
but you had to wait 17 years to get it. There's a long lead time, but when you get it, the returns are enormous. This is the first EC program that I was involved in, the diabetes program. It started in 2001. Two days ago, one of my partners in that published this paper in Nature Medicine. They had done something quite extraordinary and quite groundbreaking. Most new drugs are designed to act at a single receptor. They had looked at the physiology, the physiology that we'd understood, we'd put together for understanding the control of obesity, and they designed a drug to act at three different receptors to act in a complementary way. What they found is that in rodents, so far it has dramatic effects on weight loss. What these hormones are doing uniquely is they're trying to mimic the signals from the gut that are disturbed by gastric bypass. They tried, in other words, to find a pharmaceutical alternative to surgery through this technique. Yet to be seen, of course, it's only just published, human studies will be starting. I'm going to stop there. These are, just to thank, there's too many people that have been involved with me and my research over the years to mention. I'll just mention three key members of the team who've been with me for a long time, are still there. Nancy Sabatia, Duncan McGregor, and John Menzies. And these are the main funders, the diabetes program that I've, I've mentioned. And the EC are funding us and many others as part of a large consortium in three big programs that are still running. The Full for Health program is about understanding the communication between the gut and the brain. The Neurofast program is about understanding the reward mechanisms in food intake. And the new one, which has just started, the Nudget program, is about understanding the behavioral determinants of food choice. So I have to thank the EU, to thank all my collaborators, and again, thank you for staying with me. Okay, so I think everybody agrees. Uh, Fantastic talk by Gavin. Does anybody have any, any questions for Gavin? Yeah, please. Thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks for that really nice talk. It's very interesting. Uh, my question is: You showed us very well how once you get to a higher weight, that your body kind of thinks, oh, "This is my this is my weight. This is this is what I should be." Um, and is it does it go down just as fast as when you you know, when you give up the diet for long enough, for example, is there any, what is the evidence? Uh, well, is it actually really hard it's, to it's a, no, it, well, it, it, it is, it, it is pretty hard. Um, one of the, one of the, there's, there have been some really big studies on this, looking for actually what it is that is best predictor of weight gain. And actually, there's that, the biggest study of adolescents, they looked at predictors of the environment and the behavior that would predict how obese they would be in the future. And the biggest single predictor they found was in engagement in weight loss programs, engagement in diets. But actually, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the youngsters that were actually already undertaking diets were likely to put on most weight in years ahead. And the problem is, it's what's called yo-yo dieting. Uh, you, you, each time you diet, you bounce back very, very fast, and you tend to overshoot. And there is a problem with many people that repeated dieting, that goes on and the, the weight, of weight control just runs out of control completely. Yeah, please, yes. um, you mentioned the role of the high performance. You didn't mention the role of, with respect, you didn't mention the role of the lack of energy going into the brain, which is correlated to diabetes, obesity, and to dementia. Uh, the, I didn't. The, uh, of course, the, one of the things, oh, there are many things I didn't mention. Uh, of many things I didn't mention. In the hypothalamus, there are populations of glucose responsive cells. And there are cells in the hypothalamus, in those parts, that are responsive to insulin as well. Now, the, one of the parts of the hypothalamus adjacent to the part that I talked about, which is, is a part called the ventromedial hypothalamus, is key in the control of glucose homeostasis. And this part has glucose sensing cells, is sensitive to insulin, and interacts with the archaic nucleus. And it controls through its descending pathways the secretion of glucagon 
and probably insulin as well. And so what we now know is that interventions in that part of the hypothalamus, in the rat, can in, in, induce diabetes. Now exactly uh, the pathology of what, what goes on is complex and, and, and is, is, is uncertain. And certainly the glial cells play a very key role in mediating signals about glucose homeostasis to those cells in the ventromedial nucleus of the hypothalamus. Can I just add to that? Mm -hmm. I the reason I ask is because I think that the, the key um, measure of modern obesity and diabetes is actually dementia. Because the sugars in particular, I don't think the facts do this, and possibly do, suppress the cerebral glucose and prevent glucose going into the brain, which obviously would be happening in the hypothalamus as well. And consequently, you have a chronic, the more you eat, the less glucose goes into the brain. Short circuit. Mm. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I'm a clinician, I just wanted to ask uh, a question about drug development for the future based on, on your talk. Um, to my understanding, most, most of the drugs that have been developed with a neuroscientific target have quite severe uh, the psychiatric or cardiovascular side effects and they've been discontinued. So we're currently trying to use diabetes drugs, potentially as treatments for obesity. Do you see a drug coming along any time in the near future based on a neuroscientific target? Well, it depends on what you call neuroscience target. I mean, you're quite right that the, all the, the drugs that have been developed through neural targets so far, which have been single target drugs, have, for one reason or another, um, uh, not been uh, pursued. I mean, for instance, I mean, I mentioned these those cells that produce alpha MSH. That's an interesting story there, because alpha MSH is a phenomenally powerful inhibitor of feeding. And of course there was massive development of drugs that would mimic its actions to, to suppress feeding. It was, they were phenomenally effective, very, very effective at reducing weight loss. But it has one big problem. Those cells that, uh, those, are, those cells that I mentioned that are called control alpha MSH, they don't only switch off appetite, they also switch on libido. And the real problem was that when those drugs were first given to human volunteers, Yes, they switched off their appetite, they also gave them erections. Now you might think that's fantastic, you know, uh, isn't this a wonderful drug? And it stimulates libido, uh, stimulates your sex life and makes you thin at the same time and also incidentally might give you a tan, you know, it's a kind of, but the problem is to, in terms of getting regulatory approval for a drug like that, that was just not possible. And this is the problem with neuroscience targets, the systems are so intertangled that it's very difficult to see that you can actually find a place where you can intervene. But these new drugs are different, because what they're doing is they're not looking at the circuits within the brain, they're actually looking at the signals to the brain. And so in a sense they are neuroscience targets, but they're mimicking the actions of hormones that are normally released from the gut and other things. And so that is the prospect. If there's going to be a discovery for, if you like, a neuroscience target, it is going to be a neuroscience target, but it's not going to be, I don't think, mimicking the interactions between those cells, but mimicking the signals to them. Yes, please. Um, I, know, I know that the MI uh, charts are misused. They're not used with the original interpreter of grid for um, We do have them, and I'm, I'm wondering, I suspect your weight history is not unusual, and that you're probably not any less healthy than certainly neither they were when you were 18. And I wonder if we should, if we're going to have them, should we have them um, that change with age? Because I wonder if, or is, is when we're 50 or 60, trying to get to the weight of the weight to be feeding into the, the diet and culture and more likely to make it fatter. That is an, a very, very good question, uh, and, and it, is, it, it is an issue that people are increasingly paying more attention to, because actually what is a healthy weight is different as you age. And in fact, in, in what is called the normal healthy weight range, actually that, includes, that is, is probably set too low because actually having a weight at the lower end of that, it looks as though you're actually at higher risk of, of death than at, at a higher weight. And indeed, some of the most recent studies suggest that actually if you just look at mortality overall, then you're better off in the overweight range. But this, it, this varies with, uh, with age. The real problem is that it's very much an individual issue. In fact, the link with obesity and diabetes is a good case in point. Uh, there's a very strong link between obesity and diabetes, but it's massively variable from one country to another. 
And in fact, uh, rates of diabetes are very, very high in Japan. They're linked with, with, with body weight in Japan, but Japan doesn't have an obesity problem. So it's, it's, diabetes is, is affecting those at a much lower body weight than they are here. And so there's the, there are these inter, the differences between individuals. So what is a healthy weight for me may not be a healthy weight for you. And, and we do need a kind of nuanced understanding of what actually for an individual is the, the safe and healthy body weight. And I don't think we have it yet. In a sense, you know, we have to work with crude messages to the people. But actually, you know, on the ground we have to interpret them and don't, you know, it's, uh, and, and you've got to use some, I can only say common sense. Yes, please. Thanks very much for a very interesting talk. Um, as a lay person, uh, I see um, uh, evidence about uh, epigenetic uh, <coughs> yeah. effects over generations. And I'm wondering whether you feel that it's compelling and interesting evidence or whether it's been overstated? I think it's really fascinating, probably, probably very, very important. We know that we, I just, I mean, it, it was a, a, a step too far for me to cover in here, but we know that basically that the early life environment, even before you're born, will influence your genes, not in terms of the content of the DNA, but in fact through a process that's, that we call epigenetics that involves modification of the expression of those genes that will have lifelong effects. So, for instance, we know now that children that are uh, born in conditions of, of hunger or starvation, whether well, the mother is starved, they will be born with a low birth weight, but they will be very prone to obesity and metabolic syndrome, just because of the early environment. We know that uh, uh, children that are born under con conditions of stress, if the stress axis is active, again we know that they will be predisposed to obesity when they grow up. And these are epigenetic effects. So yes, these are some of the things, big unanswered questions. How important are these? And these are probably not the only epigenetic effects. You know, we talk about our genes, I talked about the heritability of uh, uh, body weight. How much of that heritability is epigenetic and how much is genetic? We don't know at the moment. And there might be quite a lot more epigenetic influences that we don't understand yet. Yes, please. In, in, in the UK, well, in the UK, in the, that was all sugars, but in the, but in the UK it's mostly sucrose. In the, in, in the United States, a large part of the increase is in corn sugars, high, fru high, high fructose. At the moment, that's a small part of the total sugar in in intake in the UK. Okay, Oh, that is, is, a, is it only psychological. That's, uh, that's a kind of statement in itself. Um, are there any psychologists here that like to comment on that? Uh, and uh, eating disorders are really complex. And, 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 uh, and there's been a lot of studies as to whether we can even call obesity an eating disorder. And actually, it's not a classic eat, eating disorder. Uh, it's not like binge eating disorder. It's not like anorexia. There seem to be very different mechanisms involved in what we call eating disorders and what we call obesity, uh, uh, and what we understand as obesity. Um, so there are very different things going on. Whether there are hormones involved, you know, that, that, that is, it's very difficult to work on a topic like that because to get a model on, in an animal model, so much of our understanding depends on animal models. If you haven't got an animal that reproduces the condition, it's very, very difficult to understand what's going on. Okay, I'm sure if there's other questions, uh, Gareth, we're more than happy to, uh, to address them. What I'd like to do is, is invite all of you to take, partake of a few calories um, outside. <laughs> there's some uh, mince pies and some mulled wine. Um, there's two, two locations directly outside. There's a few posters as well from the Centre for Integrative Physiology. Please look at those. And I'd also like to uh, recommend to, uh, to all of you, those who haven't been in the Anatomy Museum, there's drinks and posters up there as well, but there's also fantastic um, anatomy exhibits. If you haven't been, it's actually it's normally open every, um, is it first? It's the last Saturday last, of every last month. Last Saturday of every, of every month. But if you haven't, haven't been, please make your way up there. And I think I'd really just uh, like to say, show your appreciation for a fantastic uh, lecture. Yeah.